Hello and welcome. In this video casting, I'm going to talk about objective functions, or in other words, loss functions in deep learning. The choice of the objective function has an impact on the speed of learning and the overall inference accuracy. Each learning task requires an adapted objective function, whether it is regression, classification, super resolution, style transfer, or generative modeling. In practice, one should benchmark results obtained from different objective functions and fine tune the hyperparameters that best suit the task at hand. In the rest of this video, I shall summarize the objective functions most commonly used in machine learning and deep learning. I have given a priority to loss functions implemented in both Keras and PyTorch. Since it sounds like a good reflection of popularity and wide adoption. For each loss function I shall provide the formula, the pros and the cons. In general, loss functions can be grouped into two categories, based on the inference task, let it be regression or classification. However, it is not exclusive, since some loss functions can be used either way, with some slight variations or modifications with one task or the other. The first objective function I'm talking about today is the mean absolute error. It is simply the sum of the loss between the true value and the predicted value. It is a quite a simple objective function, but it overall it lacks stability and robustness. Sometimes it's also called the L1 norm. Next, I shall talk about MSE or mean square error. MSE penalizes the errors by squaring them, which acts as an exaggeration factor in order to force the model to learn from previous mistakes. However, MSE is highly sensitive to outliers, and there are some modifications that suggest a solution to outliers. It is also referred to in the literature as L2 norm. Hooper loss function is one of the less common loss functions, however this method is less sensitive to outliers since it only squares the difference if it is below a predefined threshold delta. That's why the formula is defined as a case if the difference between the ground truth and the predicted value is less than or equal delta then we are going to use the MSE formula, which is the squared form. However, if this threshold or this condition is not met, then another formula that's less sensitive to outliers is used. Simply, it multiplies the difference between the ground truth and the predicted value by delta, and then subtracts half delta squared. In this sense, it takes only a portion, a fraction of the loss. In order to make this simple for imagination, let's say that the ground truth is 1 and the predicted value is 100. However, this is an outlier, since the other samples in the data set didn't have that condition. So, in this case, we'd say 1 minus 100 is negative 99 multiplied by delta let's say delta is 0.1 this way 99 is not contributing a lot of error into the complete loss function but only a 1% or 10% fraction of the 99 value to wrap it up this method is designed to be less sensitive to outliers now let's talk about Poisson distribution, or Poisson objective function. Poisson loss works based on the assumption that the data is drawn from Poisson distribution. 
and it is useful method for optimizing Gini impurity in decision trees. It's used as a parameter in popular open source libraries, such as xgpost. The Poisson objective function is based at modeling events that happen at a small rate, that is, rare events. Next on our list today is cosine similarity. The loss is defined as the dot product between the ground truth and the predicted value. The result is normalized by the summation of the ground truth over all the dataset and the predicted value for all the dataset. That's why the denominator acts as a normalization factor. This is very similar to cosine similarity and works by minimizing the dot product between the output vector and the ground truth vector. Hence, the value zero indicates maximum similarity or parallel vectors, and the value plus one indicates maximum dissimilarity or orthogonal vectors. The objective functions we have discussed so far are most commonly used with regression, but not exclusively. Starting with hinge loss and the next objective functions we are going to discuss today, they are more commonly used with classification. Hinge loss is most commonly used for optimizing support vector machines, but it suffers from the fact that its derivative is discontinuous at j equals y r. That is, when the ground truth class equal to the predicted class from the support vector machine. So the idea is that for all the classes in the categories uh, to be classified, it will get the value predicted for the probability output from the model and compare it against the ground truth value and get the difference. In order to ensure that the difference is always greater than zero, then it adds a delta, a factor that could be plus one to ensure that the maximum will always yield the right balance between the zero, that means no error, and the difference between sj negative sy of i, where sj is the output for class j from the model, and sy of i is the growth for the, for the sample i. However, this summation is exclusive when j equals y of i. That means we do this for all the labels except the true label. Otherwise, we are going to get zeros that are going to imbalance the loss function in general. And that results in the discontinuity in the derivative of this objective function. A variant was introduced that squares the difference in order to introduce a continuous derivative named squared hinge loss. Next, we shall talk about binary cross entropy. Both binary cross entropy and categorical cross entropy are most commonly used for classification and they are also named log loss. When the target is a binary classification, it's based on cross entropy between two probabilities. The probability that the sample i belongs to the class y, in this case we can say zero, and subtract the log of the one minus the probability. That way the probability is always sum to one. That's why we've got p and one minus p. Y here stands for the label. Y takes the values 0 and plus 1. So Y log B, 1 minus Y log 1 minus P. It's based on cross entropy between two probabilities. A larger cross entropy indicates a divergence and a small cross entropy indicates similarity. This method converges much faster than mean square error 
and its derivative has favorable properties such as being easier to compute and use with nonlinear activations. Binary cross entropy can be extended to multiple class or multi label classification problems. The idea is to sum over all the class labels and do the same negative y log b of y. One of the very interesting and most commonly used in training generative adversarial networks is the Kullback Lapler divergence. The idea is to minimize the distance between two probability distributions. It converges by making the probability distribution of the predicted output and the ground truth very close to each other. This is based on concepts from Shannon information theory and cross entropy. Negative logarithmic likelihood, or in short NLL, is one of the loss functions implemented in PyTorch, the deep learning library from Facebook. It is very similar to log loss and it is equivalent to maximizing the probability that a given sample is generated from the target class distribution. One of the very uncommon objective functions is Kochi Schwartz's objective function. I found it in a paper published in 2017. It's named Loss Functions for Deep Neural Networks in Classification. According to the experimental results of the paper, Cauchy Schwartz divergence was used as an objective function on both MNIST and C410 datasets and it performed much better than the log loss. You can find reference in the paper in the video description. One of the valuable reference I found during this research is the book by Andreas Steinwart on support vector machines. It describes the loss functions and categorizes them as margin-based or distance-based losses and it dives deeper into the convexity, concavity and continuity properties of each objective function and how this affects the statistical learning process. I hope that this video cast was useful for you. Feel free to comment any questions you might have. Thank you and see you in a future video casting.